The goal of this panel is to highlight the business building that is occurring worldwide, focusing on the entrepreneurial ecosystems and the innovations that are emerging. Talking about innovation, and you all each sit in three different areas, whether it's venture capital, technology transfer, and entrepreneurial itself. Can we just go down the line and talk a little bit about the innovation that you see firsthand and what you're working on today? David? Sure. Uh, Blumberg Capital is based in San Francisco with team members in New York and Tel Aviv, and we've so far invested in only early stage companies, usually seed and A rounds, which we like to lead and co-invest with Bright Angels and other folks. Most of it is in software-led companies. That's where we find the most capital efficiency. And in terms of uh, where that's spread around outside of Silicon Valley, we've found um, Austin is a home to a lot of technology, Seattle, New York, Boston, sort of the great tech hubs of the United States. And then further afield, we've found uh, excellent success in uh, Canada, Germany, UK, and Israel. The significance of the Texas market is that in the US, we have four of the top 10 fastest growing cities in Texas, uh, Austin, Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio. And we also have the fastest aging over 50 population in America. And so um, the confluence of Austin as a number one startup ecosystem in the nation with the uh, impending healthcare crisis really puts us at an interesting place to develop um, the next generation healthcare technologies. The last couple of companies I've done uh, as a co-founder and CEO have been semiconductor and communications uh, software companies. Um, and uh, But this time, the company I'm doing is not semiconductors and it's not communications. Uh, both, in my view, you know, quite difficult sectors to sort of you know, get your teeth into these days. Um, but instead, we're basically focused on applying the emerging sciences in, in artificial intelligence to the problem of safe, urban, autonomous cars, um, which is a, a sort of massive challenge for both uh, computer vision skills but also for behavioural prediction skills and motion planning skills. So to give you just one statistic, if you try and give a computer vision absolute state of the art, any global team working on this state of the art, give it a, a static picture of, of cyclists in a complex urban scene, and the best uh, research group in the world will, will basically spot 77% of cyclists in the scene. Wow. Um, so yeah, that, that's obviously problematic. Um, so, um, so, so we need to apply a lot more science to it. Now that science is emerging, uh, and it's emerging in, in schools across the world. So, I mean, definitely Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, you know, MIT, um, yeah, but also in Europe, um, in ETH, in Oxford, in Cambridge, in Imperial, in UCL, in Edinburgh. Uh, so, yeah, in the top in Amsterdam, in the top schools across across the world. The science is emerging almost on a weekly basis, um, in fact, on a daily basis, really. It's interesting. I keep hearing the word disruption, and I have a uh, personal bias that, that sounds, it sounds more parasitic than symbiotic. The one thing that, that I think is often mistook is that people talk about entrepreneurs being risk takers, as if they're these sort of leap off a cliff people, and they're not. Um, <clears throat> entrepreneurs tend to be very calculated risk takers. And I think that incentivizing disruption for the sake of disruption or incentivizing um, risk taking simply for, for the perception that that is valuable, I think is a, a big misnomer. I've always thought that sort of running a startup is a bit like um, you know, trying to make progress in a foggy environment, really, where you can kind of see the first lamppost um, and that beyond that it's kind of hazy. Um, so really, but if you can see the first lamppost, you could probably make your way towards it and try and achieve that goal. And, and as you approach that, you'll probably start to see where you should head next, and it becomes you know, a little bit more obvious at that point. Um, but because it's, it's intrinsically uncertain, you, you, you honestly have no idea if the technology approach that you're going to take, you know, the team that you've assembled, the business model you're going to go with, the kind of customers and partners you've struck initial relationships with, are there, is it actually going to be made to work or is it going to fail in some way? Um, yeah, the, the chances are it's, it's, it's definitely wrong. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the, 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 you've definitely got some wrong people. You've probably made some wrong technology choices. Yeah, some of the partners are almost certainly wrong. And, and the, the key thing, which you could call mistakes, um, but the key thing is being able to pivot. Uh, first, I'd start to say that our view of venture capital is it's, it's sort of an intermediary between raw entrepreneurship one, two person, three person teams that have a great idea, great training, very hungry and persistent about making something new happen. And then the large corporate world, which is basically 
who these folks either sell to or they go into IPO status and join the, the, the Global 2000. So we see ourselves as intermediaries because mainly we focus on the right teamwork, the right people, the selection of the people and finding those people who can survive and learn from their failures. And that is a, a culture that's, that's been grown recently very successfully in the United States, particularly Silicon Valley and places like Israel and certain parts of the ecosystem here in London and, and parts of Germany. But in general, failure is not an option in most parts of the world. In the culture of the East Asians, generally it's seen as you fail once and you're down forever. Silicon Valley is one model, and, I, and it's, it's blessed with having uh, a lot of capital at work. So just compare Silicon Valley to Austin. Roughly $24 billion in early stage investments that services roughly 1,500 deals. And Austin, which is the number one place to start a startup, right? We have roughly half a billion dollars servicing 150. So we have 148 the capital for one tenth the deal flow. I really think there's a great opportunity um, as we've commodified entrepreneurship and developed you know, programs around the globe that service entrepreneurs. We've done them a great disservice. In, in the way that um, we're valuing them yeah. and the expectations we're setting on them. I actually think it's, it's part of the maturation process for the early stage ecosystem, um, but I think there's an opportunity for the financial and the banking sector to influence that. And, and right-sizing these investments early on in the process helps them with their success. Um, so when we're giving them valuations that are commensurate with what they can achieve in their market, they build real companies with real values. They build teams that have ongoing uh, successes. If we take sort of a little bit of history, and I can't miss the point, we're about what, a mile from St. Paul's in the Paternoster Square where the London Stock Exchange was created and the bond market really came to the fore. That was the first bit of decentralization or, or liberation of, of the capital markets that allowed the money to be moved away from the agricultural gentry. All over the world it was like this, and London led the way, and with Amsterdam and a few Brussels and few, Belgium and a few places, to liberate the capital, to move it around to entrepreneurs, these rough and scruffy folks creating things like steam engines and cotton gins and railroads. And so that 19th century, with this giant growth from 0.1% GDP growth to all of history prior to 1.25% GDP growth in the next, 1800, or next uh, 200 years, last 200 years, um, really changed agriculture entirely, transportation entirely. Uh, and then the next bit was really the 20th century where we revitalized enormously manufacturing, became very automated. Most manufacturing is now highly automated. Um, and, and, and also um, mining and, and um, those sectors. And then in the new era, which is the data area that you've been talking about, communications, I'd say the new thing to automate and make much more effective and widely available to even poor segments of society are services and information. So that services and information idea, the virtualization of, of uh, the physical, transportation as a service, et cetera, logistics as a service, healthcare, um, moving it much more to a data-driven model. That's where I think the opportunities are for the future, and that's where we're looking um, in Silicon Valley and beyond.